We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and we are coming to one of our personal favorite races of the season. We're going to Mexico, and I'm so excited. It's no Singapore, but it will do. I think this is my, ooh, Mm. I don't want to say that. I was going to say I think this is, like, my favorite America's race, but I love Brazil. So Yeah, I just feel like, like, Cota... Mexico, Brazil are like back to back bangers. This, yes. And I think this is the best stretch of racing we have all season. Like, it's, you know, we're going to have a good race and a good sprint at Coda. Mexico City is always entertaining. And then we go back to like a crazy sprint in Brazil and always a good race. Weather's always a huge factor. So I think like back to back to back set of three races, this is the best we get. Yeah, fully agree. Like th- this is sometimes we we wonder about you know how F one makes its schedule and the logic behind it. See next year when we have that random Canadian race in the middle of the Europe tour, but this stretch of races is one of the best stretches of races we have. And the fact that it is toward the end where we're having one of the more competitive seasons just makes it all even more exciting. Yeah, I think it just makes the most sense too. Like. Austin, Mexico City, Brazil. Like, it's just so nice and organized. So Yeah, it, it, it is, one, is of the, like, <laughs> one of the parts that actually makes sense when it comes to the international travel portion of Formula One. Which, uh, with the regionalization they are working on, but still we don't understand Canada on next year's schedule, and we probably you know never will. I think it's because, like, it's in Montreal, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so for... French Canadian like that's sure. that's my my reasoning like they think they're they're like oh Montreal is in France oh just kidding it's actually in Canada <laughs> now we have to travel across the ocean and come back I don't know Oopsie. That's, that's all I can come up with that or I, I honestly think it's weather like that's the only time that they can do it because of weather probably yeah Montreal I mean cold like they couldn't do like they couldn't do Canada with these races like with the America's races, it would be far too cold this time of year to go to Canada. We say it's 95 degrees outside my window, but, <laughs> but technically but racing, you are correct. Like tires and stuff like that. I think that's why they have to do it then. Yeah, that, that's, that's probably, probably it. But anyway, to, to dive in, before we dive into this week, I wanted to take a, a mo- moment to look at something that we, I wouldn't say we overlooked from last week, but was generally overlooked because of so many other things like Ferrari winning at Kota when no one really expected them to, which is um, Esteban Ocon got fastest lap at Kota. He finished P18, so it didn't really matter, but he got it by stealing fastest lap from Franco Colapinto at Williams, who would have actually gotten the point from it because he was riding in what he was in P he finished in P10. So Esteban Ocon, he didn't really apologize for stealing the lap because he stole the lap because there's only four points between Williams and Alpine and it would have been five had he not taken it. But he's like, yeah, you know, Franco deserved it. Whatever. Yeah. So, but uh, well, it, as I also we... think too, because like, so right now in the driver's standings, like Colapinto and Ocon are tied. Technically. Yeah. They have five points. Colapinto's ahead of them because he's finished higher use my dog um <laughs> and his story um so I think that's it too just so because he doesn't want to like fall even further down behind the guy who's only raced in three races and he's been there for you know a whole season but yeah well that but and also because of you know the 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 constructors battle is really yeah. where where it, it it comes into play just because Alpine a didn't expect to be this bad this year and the the closer that they can get to Williams towards the end of the year could possibly mean a flip-flop in the positions which is of course money right and one point is all it takes but I think his comment about like oh Franco deserves it is like, welcome to F1, buddy. Like, this is how it works. <laughs> Nothing is handed to you. you right, know, right, exactly. Get stolen right from out underneath, uh, right from underneath you. So I think that, I mean, I think it's all in do fun. And, and Franco came back at it and he is like, 
you know, they used a whole another set of tires. Like we're trying to save the planet. Like what are you doing over there? Um, so I think it's all in good fun. Like it wasn't, I don't think anything was, you know, malicious and it's just the strategy. It's how it, it's how it is. So. Yeah. I just, I saw the headline, Akon, sorry for stealing fastest lap. And I was like, I don't think Akon has ever been sorry about anything that he's done racing, like genuinely in his entire career. That's part of the reasons why he's going to Haas next year. (laughs) But now that this has happened, Haas is, or not Haas, Esteban Akon is officially third all time in most races before setting a fastest lap in a race behind Yarno Trulli, who had, who took 203 races and Jensen Button, who did it in 155. Esteban Akon did it in 152 starts. Wow. Yeah, that's interesting that Jensen Button. It took Jensen Button that long when he ended up like he was a world champion in yeah, two thousand nine. World champion. Yeah, and Lance Stroll is now the official only active F one driver yet to set a fastest lap. He's currently in third at one hundred and sixty four entries, but if he starts this weekend, he will be tied with Martin Brundle and Johnny Herbert, who both did not set a fastest lap in their in their uh, careers and. As he continues going, he will set the record for, you know, longest uh, or current active driver who has not yet set a fastest lap. Another stat that you don't want. (laughs) But it's still funny. But it is. It is. Um, Okay. So now let's talk contracts. Woo. Uh, Not uh, really. (laughs) Update to potential contracts, let's say. Yes. So Bonato came out, so he's taken over the role of team principal moving CEO. forward with CEO, whatever, same thing, <laughs> CEO. No, he's not the team principal because uh, uh, Jonathan Wheaton, the other guy. who formerly from yeah. Red Bull, is going to be team, uh, team principal next year or okay. in two years. Yes. So Bonato he's, he's the a CEO. very high-ranking individual <laughs> at some team that will be named something going forward. <laughs> That's the best way I can do it. He came out and announced that the second seat of Steak Sour will be determined and announced mid-November. So this is the last second kind of seat. Well, mm, I'm not really counting B-carb, but this is right. like the last who, like the last seat of mystery, let's say, because we really don't know who's going to be taking this last seat. It's been rumored that Botas will take it. Cola Pinto is really making a, you know, a a bleh, strong words. push for He's it. He's making a strong play for the second seat. Um, or uh, Bordoletto. He's also his name has also been in the mix. So I I don't know why they need till mid November. Honestly, I feel like they could probably make a decision now. The only reason why I would think it would be till mid November is if they want to see Cola Pinto race a few more races. But at the end of the day, I really think this is going to end up going to Botas, which is a travesty considering how he's raced this year. I mean, yeah, the the one of the biggest problems is that this this car has has done actual damage to Botas's reputation as a driver. Obviously, Botas's reputation as a character in Formula One is has never been better, especially now that that Danny's gone. He's kind of the he's the fun one now. But yeah. when it comes to him as a driver, like we said at the end of the last episode, he's twenty third in a twenty driver championship, and this is the the Valtteri Botas who has won races, who tore it up at Mercedes, um, who you know he he was the guy behind Lewis Hamilton, and he was the guy who helped Lewis Hamilton to his his championships and helped Mercedes to all those constructors wins. So the fact that Botas is this far in the toilet because the car is so bad, really, yeah, it's really sad. It's 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 really really unfortunate for him. And it's kind of like, do we want Franco Colapinto to be in a car like this? I mean, the answer is we want him on the grid. He'll right. get onto the grid at some point. Bortoletto is technically, uh, Gabriel Bortoletto, who's an F2 driver, he's technically been in the mix, because probably him, not anymore. He has a 0% chance. <laughs> he, he has a, I would be shocked if they overlooked both, or if they overlook Joe Botas and Colapinto in favor of, of Bortoletto, I would be shocked. Bortoletto okay, so will Catherine's get on the grid betting, anyway eventually. If Bortoletto is on the grid next season, she will wear a Mercedes hat or shirt that I will buy her for at least one podcast <laughs> as long as it's black <laughs> we we, we got to stick with the aesthetic here but I would, agreement. I would be shocked okay. um, so so we'll see but I yeah it's 
they just need to come up with a better car next year, which obviously heads are going to roll. And I think we're going to see like a big shift in personnel in the off season, but they quite frankly, they need a better car and they need a driver who can drive that car. It's like such a throwaway season. So it doesn't even matter because it's a weird sour, like sour season. And then it goes to Audi and the team is transitioning. So are they even going to put effort into next season? I mean, I think that they should, I think they should put some effort because anything that they, you know, anything that they do is also going to have an impact on the 2026 car and the new regulation. Obviously that's going to be a completely different car, but you still like, we saw what happened with Haas when they went full on rookie and they said bag 2021 in favor of 2022. Like that did not look good. Nobody liked that. And I don't think any team wants to replicate something like that. So, you know, they're so going to maybe they maybe try they to like the, score a point next year. Maybe they do the Haas approach after that and just bring in two veterans just to like keep the car damage to a minimum and hope, right. the, you know, hope for the best going forward. But I mean, I, if anything, I see Botas getting like a one year contract, if that. Which is what I, they want to do so that exactly. they can figure out who they really want to take into Audi. Because obviously they have Nico Hulkenberg who's going to come in next year. And so it's who's going to drive with him. And, you know, they're probably paying out the nose for Hulkenberg to come to them. So they're going to want, like, he's going to also want a good car. And there has to be a reason why he's willing to sacrifice a year Hulk of his just career. It doesn't seem like. I know he's just happy to still be on the grid. Right. He doesn't seem like he's pulling in, you know, contracts like Lando or Oscar or those. Well, you know, no, drivers. I mean, definitely not. He's but driving he's in the bottom half of the grid. more expensive than a rookie. I don't know. I just, I, I want to see, obviously you want to see our boy Franco on the grid, but I just don't think it's going to be a stake. I really think it's going to be as soon as Alex Albon's contract is up they'll put Colapinto in. Or if Albon doesn't yeah. drive very well next season, they'll replace him with Colapinto again. I don't know if we would see a, a mid-season replacement from, for Albon, unless he, like, starts racking up millions of dollars in car damage. Yeah, maybe To the fair. level of, of Logan Sart, of what Logan Sargent I don't know. I done. just, oh God, my dream is to see Carlos... And Franco drive Williams together. And I think eventually we will. It might not be until 26 or 27, but I think that we will. Yeah, we'll see. Well, there we go. More speculation and all of our tin tin foil hat. Tin foil hatting. Yep. All right. Shall we get into Mexico? Yes, let's talk. Sorry, Mexico Mexico City. It's not Mexico. It is Mexico City. Yes. Though, if you're ESPN, you're calling it the Mexican Grand Prix, which (laughs) technically, if you look at the full name of the race, and I did this because I was second guessing myself earlier, the the full name in Spanish is the the Grand Prix of Mexico City. Therefore, it is not the Mexican Grand Prix. The Mexican Grand Prix, we've had that, but it was, you know, different branding. Right now, it's the Mexico City Grand Prix. Is there a difference? Absolutely not. But we will point out people's errors. Yes, like ESPN. Um, Okay, before we get to Mexico, I just want to sidebar and go off track here. Did you feel, like, as an American fan of F1, did you feel so, like, overwhelmed by, like, the spotlight it got this weekend? Because it was in Austin with a big football weekend. Like, watching the Georgia-Texas game on Saturday, they kept, like, bringing up F1 references and, like, telling people to tune in on Sunday. It was, like, overwhelming, but also, like, exciting to see so much, you know, spotlight on F1. Because, like, for Americans, we have to pretty much search for things, like ESPN News number five to find everything, or, you know, ESPN A B Ocho. Um, (laughs) And literally... It was so refreshing to, like, see commentators even talk about it. I, they were using the wrong references, and that made me giggle, but, like, at least they were trying. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, no, I, I, I agree, because I, I think I've told you multiple times before that I'll be, like, watching SportsCenter, because 90% of the time my TV is on SportsCenter during the day, just in the background when I'm working. Same. And if, 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 they, if, like, the Formula One news comes up, like it has usually like in and around race weekends or if there's like some big big news like they'll talk about it and I'll be like I feel weird that they're talking about Formula One on Sports Center 
Like there's yeah, just something like, that feels really weird. Why are they taking it? my sport from me? Why are they, why are it's, they it's like it? it's like do do they know what this is? Which like obviously they do, and obviously ESPN is the partner of Formula One in the United States, so of course right. they like know Formula One. Nicole Briscoe has to do those stupid reads of every week of <laughs> of like the you know the Formula thank One etc. Grand Prix. Yeah, thank you for watching. <laughs> We're cutting to commercial. Exclusive Ex- content was provided by Mercedes Benz. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, so like, it, but it's it, it's still it just it feels so felt so weird to me. But like the fact that like Formula One has grown enough in the United States that the biggest name in sports TV channels, shut up Fox Sports, is talking about Formula One in this way and like integrating their marketing with college football is right. something that's really unprecedented and is, is actually pretty cool. Even though seeing most of the drivers on the sidelines at the Texas game was just funny because they didn't know what was, was going on or where they were. It was just yeah. uncomfortable. But, no, but the fact that they it's... are integrating is cool. Yeah, 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 for sure. And I think it's like, we get Monaco that gets like really publicized because it's Monaco. And then I feel like Coda gets it more than, Miami and last year I think Vegas got a lot more promotion because it's Vegas right but um it's just interesting and I don't know I I enjoy it. like some of my friends will be like oh do you know there's an F1 race this weekend and I'm like yeah, yes I, I do <laughs> well yeah I saw it on ESPN you you like that stuff right I'm like just yeah, a little bit um, yeah thank you bless thank you. you um I I, I I I might be aware of it there might be a <laughs> podcast episode or two or 50 um yeah exactly, no you're, you're but... totally right and it's I mean, it's it's cool, even though it just feels really weird. And like the way that they'll pronounce some of the names, I'm just like, I know that I'm not perfect with my name pronunciations, but pronunciation guides are a thing that exists and they should read them. Yeah. I don't know who it was, but someone said Max Verstappen and it just made me cringe. I was like, Verstappen! I mean, I, oh! I, I don't think it's technically wrong. Cause, no, cause, I don't like it. It's wrong. Well, well, I don't either. He who must not be named would 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 say Verstappen instead of Verstappen. So like, like I said, I'm an American, and we're we're saying all these these foreign names as best we can. But I see your point. It feels weird to me too. I kind of just go like the Verstappen. crafty root of of like however crafty pronounces it is how I am going to attempt to pronounce the names. <laughs> I love that's it. I that's love like it. my that's my my rule of thumb for for these people <laughs> um and also joe like i say jose you say yos because that's the correct pronunciation but i right. say Joe's. i refuse to pronounce it correctly because yeah. the foodie is the person anyways okay let's get back on track with mexico so i would be remiss if we went to 2024 without talking about 2023 again podcast where we don't actually talk about the year that we're in right um so <laughs> last year Sheka yep. Sheka was out in the opening corner and it made my life it was really sad like because it's his home race and it was really you know depressing for him I just think it's funny because he was like hyping it up the entire time but the big 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 thing that happened last year was Danny came back and he got P7 which got him a ton of points Alfatari moved up in the constructors and that was like his big big moment of the year last year and that's really I think what secured his seat for this year which he's kind of lost but right. um, it was really really fun to see Danny get P7 last year yeah this this whole stretch was really good for him but like not only did he finish P7 which was Alfatari's best finish of the season at the time but and it moved them up a position in the constructor standings. But more importantly, that gave them about $20 million in prize money at the end of the year because of their finishing position. So it was a really huge deal for him to come back, especially after the broken hand, after, you know, Liam Lawson came in, after AlphaTauri maxed out the number of drivers that they could put in their cars, which is absurd. But... Yeah, that was that was that was one of those big deal, really fun moments of that weekend where with a podium, that was of course another one of those Max Verstappen wins from a Charles Leclerc pole, which is always still funny. But that and that podium was Max Lewis Hamilton, Charles Leclerc. Yeah. Uh, well, this year we have a lot to look forward to. Some new things, some old things, some exciting things. The most exciting thing is the F1 theme song played by mariachi a mariachi band. This is my favorite race intro of the year, mostly because it's the only intro that changes, but they do have mariachi band do 
the theme song for Mexico City, and it makes my life every single time. Some of the races, I'll, like, miss the intro, but I always make sure I catch it for Mexico City. Yeah, this this is fully one of my favorite alternatives to the F1 theme song. And they've had over, over the years, not since we've been F1 fans, but over the years, they have had a few different special themes. But this is the one for, like, the... The drive to survive generation and the the 2021 and on generation. This is the most fun F1 theme song that we have on the in, on the calendar. Yeah, no, I love it. It's so so many funs, so many funs. So Mexico City is one of the races actually because there's only I guess half the races that Catherine and I have done twice now. So Mexico City mm-hmm. we did cover last year um, when we started the podcast, and something that we talked about at length was the altitude. So altitude hasn't gone anywhere, still the same, arguments are all there, but it's always interesting to see with the short turnaround time from CODA, like how they reconfigure the cars, because the altitude really does a lot to everything associated with the car, and they only have, you know, a few days to take the car that they're driving in CODA, which is basically at sea level, maybe a few meters above sea level, to Mexico City, which is 7,300 feet above sea level or about 2,200 meters, um, which is insane. Yeah. And the fact that it's it's like the only two races on the calendar that are that high are Mexico and Brazil, but Brazil is only 800 meters above sea level. Like it's like it's not even close, but the so thinner air from, you know, higher altitude, it'll impact downforce, aerodynamics, you know, keeping the engine cool is one of the the biggest challenges that the driver, uh, that the teams are going to face in the the mechanic side. So, you you know, overheating is bad because overheating means cars go boom. Fortunately, these teams have been driving in Mexico for a while. This is not an unfamiliar territory for them. So they have, you know, they have the action plan for how they go into air, you know, um, to words, Catherine, to Mexico. But still, it is one of the more unique challenges to this track, other than the fact that this is a short fa- track, a fast track, and really coolly configured because we have our favorite, one of our favorite portions of any F1 track, the stadium section. Oh, such a good section. Yeah. But yeah, it's just, but to me, it's crazy, like, how much work they'll have to put in to really change up majority of the car. Yeah, there, there's there's some pretty significant setups. You'll see some teams that'll be using um, the their different front wings, or not front wings, rear wings, different front wing specifications, but they're going to have, some of them will have different rear wings, and it'll it'll change up the strategy. Some teams are um, a lot better suited toward, you know, this environment than others. So you'll see teams that are higher up the grid, case in point, Danny and the Alphatari last year. We'll see what, what um, Yuki and Liam Lawson can do in the V-Carb this year. But yeah, it, it'll be it'll be really interesting to see how the teams are able to adapt, especially with the short turnaround, which every year is a short turnaround between Mexico, the United States and Mexico. But still, it's a challenge. And sometimes teams have brain farts. So we'll see. Oh, Winston. Oh my gosh, he's just running into his sleep and snoring. Aww. He went to daycare today, so he's very tired and he's been sick. So, oh my gosh, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Winston, stop. Okay. It's okay. Bishop has nightmares. Sometimes where she'll wake up screaming and I'm like, oh, ma'am, are you okay? He's asleep all the time. He's like running and then like all of a sudden he'll hit his kennel or he'll fall off the bed and he'll be like, <gasps> yeah. um, okay. So something yes. else fun this weekend is we have more young drivers on the grid in FP1. Yeah. Um, so we will see our good old friend Ollie Behrman back. So he'll be driving for Haas this weekend. No, wait, he'll be driving for Ferrari. I wrote that wrong. Oh, sorry. Catherine, I rely on you for everything. <laughs> you honestly could put like complete bullshit in here. Yeah. And I'd be like, so Ferrari is selling. <laughs> <laughs> Um, for those of you who don't know, Catherine puts so much time and dedication into pulling all these things together. I'm really here just for the laughs, but she has more time than I do, so. Yes. Yay. <laughs> um, so he'll be driving for Ferrari. Kimi Antonelli, who will be taking Lewis's seat at Mercedes next season, will be driving for Mercedes this weekend. Um, Felipe Drogovic will be driving for Austin Martin. And then 
I don't want to like stereotype, but I'm just going to go out on a whim and say this next driver is uh, Irish. Um, I don't Paddle think so. Award. How are you not Irish? No, no. He, you, you know the best part? He's, he's from Mexico. McLaren FP1. Right on, Pato. Yeah, um, it's he. It's yeah. It's his. He he's he's basically a junior. His dad is the same name. There's probably some someone in in the family. Definitely not native from, from Mexico. But yeah, he's he's a he's a Mexican driver. He drives for Aero McLaren in IndyCar. He's you know part of the stable. They've been talking about getting him into Formula One kind of like forever. Um, he's he's one of like Zach Brown's favorite non current F one drivers. He, he he's really kind of one of one of his his little 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 buddies that he keeps in his back pocket to remind Formula well, One that IndyCar drivers are capable of driving in Formula One, which like is not inaccurate, but also like we don't care. IndyCar is where Formula One careers go to die. It's probably where Danny will end up if Danny doesn't like do something fun like NASCAR. Danny, oh my god, I could totally see Danny doing NASCAR. <laughs> that would be hilarious, honestly. <laughs> um, okay, well, apologies to my boy Pato. Um, best of luck in FP1. So for FP2, we will see something a little different. So we are going to have 90 minutes for FP2 for a Pirelli tire test. So 30 minutes for testing the 2025 tires and then 60 minutes for a normal FP2. So, I mean, I guess this is kind of good for people who are missing out on FP1 for the young drivers, but at the same time, those 30 minutes with the new, with the 2025 tires are going to be completely different than what they're nor, uh, used to with the normal tires. So should be interesting. If, um, if you're fascinated by tire construction and you know you you want to sit through it, it, it it's 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 sometimes worth the watch just to to see kind of a preview of what we're gonna have for the next year. The tires I think are gonna be different sized next year, so I'm not sure how that's gonna work with the current cars. But they might just have the tire construction in the same t size tires just yeah. to see how the how the mixtures work. Because one of the things that Pirelli does every year is they adjust what their the levels mean because obviously we have for, for those of you who don't know you have five different types of tires you know one two three four and five and the the ones are the hardest the fives are the softest and every race Pirelli will choose the three tires you know it'll be one two and three two three and four three four and five sometimes they'll skip and they'll do like five three and two but that's very rare to, to kind of see which tires are going to be best on which track. So sometimes a soft tire will actually be a harder tire depending on which track we're, we're on. And so this gives uh, Pirelli the opportunity to see what next year's tires are going to look like in an actual, you know, driving run plans type of situation and scenario, which we have a few of these throughout the year. This is just one of the few that happens during the race weekend. And I think it's interesting that they're doing it at Mexico City because like we were saying earlier, altitude really changes everything. So I feel yeah. like this is a very, you know, outlier race, but maybe that's why they're doing it. Yeah, it's I don't I don't even remember where they did the tire test last year, but I feel like it was somewhere closer to sea level, but it also depends on like track configurations and sometimes the like the the tarmacs that the cars drive on are completely different from one track to another. Right. So sometimes I I'm assuming that sometimes they just mix it up, so we'll see. Yeah. Well, it should be interesting. We get mm -hmm. 30 extra minutes of F1 racing, so. Yep. Or not racing, but cars going through. Okay. If you have your bingo card out, get ready to check it off and check it twice. This weekend is Fernando Alonso's 400th F1 race, which just makes us age him incredibly. So, yeah, it's he's so many the first F1 driver to enter 400 F1 races, which just goes to show how long he's been like a dominant force 
in this sport. This year, not so much. Last year, he really came around and came back, landed on the podium several times. But yeah, so this is super exciting. To be technical, it is really only his 397th start, if he does start this If weekend. he starts, yeah. If he starts this weekend. So in three races, it'll be his actual like 400th start, but it is his 400th race. Yeah, which is cool. I mean, so we've only had, other than Fernando, six other Formula One drivers who have entered, you know, 300 or more races. Kimi Raikkonen, 353. Lewis Hamilton, 351. Rubens Barrichello, 326. Jensen Button, 309. Michael Schumacher, 308. And Sebastian Vettel just snuck in at 300. So it's... There have been a lot of F1 drivers in the like the 74 years that the sport has existed. Some have lasted a long time, some have not. But to make it to 300 is a huge milestone. Or I mean, even to make it to 100 races at this point right. is a huge milestone. Obviously, we had that last week with Alex Albon. But to make it to 400 is just obscene. It's insane. And also, I just want to promote our F101, F1 Team Genealogy series really quickly, because if you listen to any of those episodes, I guarantee you heard one of those six names because they've all driven for so many teams. <laughs> yes, you have de- You have definitely heard of all of those names, um, and we will link the Ruben series Sarah above. Hello, I swear, has like driven Drove everywhere. on every team. He's driven for more teams than anybody else but no it's it's really crazy especially if you think about how competitive the sport is and how many like one and guns we get or you know you get your second year and you're not good you get pulled halfway through so if you think about it to get to 100 races you have to like successfully complete or at least make it into like your fifth season which I think is really rare Honestly, it, it it would even be more than that because the the twenty plus race seasons is is relatively new in the grand scheme of Formula One. Maybe the right, last so ten modern years. Day, modern so, day, it would so, be like so. And, and if you look at these drivers, these are all drivers who have driven. You know, let let's say from the nineties on. Yeah, like th- so this they would have been in seasons with like fewer races, so they yeah, would have had to make it through exactly. so many seasons. Yeah. So modern day, I'd say it's like five in the past, probably like seven or eight. At at least. At least, Um, yeah, which is crazy. Yeah, so obviously we are having more and more in one day. Stefano Domenicali's dream of a 52-week season will come true, um, maybe. But it's, yeah, this is, this is a, a... huge milestone not just for fernando but for for any driver who makes it to I, like you know max verstappen earlier this year he made it to 200 races and he's like there is no way on god's green earth i am going for 400 like that ain't happening so it's 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 not easy but if you're someone like fernando alonso who just insists on continuing to perform and put on you know the these performances and get points and make it worth it for him to stay like that's credit to fernando yeah okay let's hit hit you guys with some highlights of his career here so to age him his first entry was in 2001 (laughs) with minority and that was at the australian grand prix he won two years later with renault at the uh, 2003 Hungarian Grand Prix. He won his first World Drivers Championship two years later with Renault in 2005, which is absolutely insane. So, also, like, this can we is... talk about today or like this week? He's been talking about how he thought that he would like his career was going to end in 2009 after his contract was up with McLaren. Like, yeah, th- 2009 was a long time ago. It doesn't feel like it because we have really bad perceptions of time right now, but. It's 2024, and to, to think that, like, Fernando thought he was going to stop in 2009 is just wild. Yeah. That's, yeah, and he's done good things since 2009, too. So, in total, he's driven for six different constructors over 21 seasons. So, if you're like, wait, that math doesn't math, he did take two years off between um, who... Renault, it, no. Uh, he was he went to Alpine, but he was with um, who was he with? Hold on, hold on, bringing up because he was somewhere. Oh, he was at McLaren. 
Um, and then he went, yeah, and he was with McLaren, I think, and because he went back to McLaren, and then he went to Alpine, he retired, he, and then he came back and went to Alpine, and then he went to Aston Martin. Yeah, he retired in 2018 and came back in 2021. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Um, so he skipped a few seasons, but he went. He, he went rallying, he, he spent some time yeah. in IndyCar, you know, yeah. had had some fun. Doing good things um, for 21 seasons. He has 32 wins, 22 poles. 26 fastest laps, 106 podiums, five hat tricks, one grand slam, and one sabbatical in uh, IndyCar and rallying. So, yeah. Good for him, man. Yeah. And he's it, raced it, with a lot of good people, too. Yeah. If you look at these names, it's like Yarno Trulli, Jacques Villeneuve, Giancarlo Fisichella, Lewis Hamilton, Nelson Piquet Jr., Roman Grosjean, Felipe Massa, Kimi Raikkonen, Jensen Button, Stoffel Van Dorn, Esteban Ocon, and of course, Lance Stroll. Good old Lance. Yeah. And more more importantly, he has one of the coolest helmets to commemorate this weekend. Oh, it's honestly, it's in the running for my favorite of the season. It really is. The panda is so good, but I think this this might top it. I mean, it's it's fully up there. If you have not yet seen pictures of the helmet, get the to the Aston Martin uh, Instagram account and just look at that helmet. It's so cool. It chronicles his career. Entire and, you career, know, yeah. It's it's so well done. Like, we, we've seen some really great helmets this year. This is fully one of them. It was not on my bingo card to have Fernando Alonso come out with a helmet that we loved. Normally, he has, like, the dumbest designed helmets, and I hate them. Well, either that um, or just keeps the same helmet, because he's, like, he's not really one of the guys who has, who does, like, the special helmet thing. Right. But I think it's really cool. So it looks like it's, you know, old film that wraps around the helmet, and in each, like, box is a different picture from a different moment in his career. Words can only do it so much justice. Honestly, go see it. It's super, super cool. Yeah, I I can't say enough good things about it, so. Yeah, and then other helmets, I, I don't think I've seen any other helmets except Sergio Perez has released his his Minister of Defense helmet, which is it's fine. It's got one of the the um, Mexican uh, luchador masks on on the top. It looks a lot better than the Disney Plus helmet he had last week at Cota. So at least we we can give him that. But still, if you're if you're comparing, you know, Fernando's and Checo's, Fernando's wins by a mile. And if there are any other helmets of note, we will make note of them in the reaction episode. If there are any yeah. notable ones that we care about, if there's not, we'll ignore them. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Time to get into our predictions for Mexico City. So, Catherine and I make predictions. We choose pole, podium, and P10. We give ourselves points this year because last year we were taking some liberties. This year we're taking it super seriously and still not doing great. Mm -hmm. Um, But pole is the first one that we picked. So, Catherine, who's your pole setter for Mexico City Grand Prix? Uh, I am going to go with Lando. I feel like that's the safe bet right now. Ah, funny. You know, I decided it's time to really lock in with my uh, Ferrari men. So I am picking Charles Leclerc. Okay. I shoot myself in the foot on Sunday, but that's okay. Or Saturday, I mean, whatever day. Doesn't matter. I thought about. I I thought about it. Um, I definitely considered that. But I, I feel just, like he looked so good at Coda. He, really, he and did. I know, and I know it's like only because he got in front that first corner, but he was so far ahead, like, and he just raced such a good race. I think he's he's pulling for the drivers championship. He oh yeah, it, and, but he's I think he's for pulling for constructors. But I, you know, he he looks really good, but I think the McLaren is still really fast on one lap right now, and that's fair. that's that's what that's I'm fair. going with. But that said. We want to move over to the podium. Yeah, who do you got for your podium? My podium is Charles Leclerc, Max Verstappen, Lando Norris. So ah, I have semi the same thing. I have Max Verstappen, Charles Leclerc, and Lando Norris. Ooh, giving Max the W. Mm-hmm. Okay. Can't see it, but we'll see. Um, and then for P10, Catherine and I pick P10 because it is the last place on the grid to receive a to receive points you get one point for p10 we actually give ourselves three because it is very hard to guess so 
I don't like my choice for P10, but I did it anyways because I feel like it's more realistic than my hopes and dreams. I put Franco Colapinto. Also, I, I like his number one. Okay, cool. I yeah. like his number yeah. one fan. I'm like, he's going to get P5. I just know it. He needs to start qualifying better. I yes. think he's struggling a little bit with qualifying, but he does make up places in the race. So I think P10 is very realistic for him to do back to back, especially with not having like a sprint before. So I'd like to see him in the points again. Yeah, I, I, that's that's kind of where where I was was going with this too. You're you're right. He does need to to work on his qualifying pace, but the fact that he can still move up the grid in let's be real, a not great Williams does yeah. really speak to to his skill. Also, um, apparently, like he fought with the Williams strategists to go on that hard tire strategy to start last week's race. So like, the kid kind of knows what he's doing, which is cool. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I give him a lot of credit for like going for it with within his team of not just being like oh I'm just here to help out like I have to like nod my head and say yes and I'm just here to you know whatever and I good for him for being like no this is what we need to do like I believe in this and like really standing up for to the strategy so yeah exactly he's just taking after Carlos him and Carlos will be such great teammates when drivers and strategists yes exactly okay so Last but not least, Catherine and I do a surprise of the weekend, and then who's going to do a dub? We don't give ourselves points for these because these are just kind of fun for us to do on the side. But this week, I know my surprise is going to come true because I have Ferrari jumping Red Bull in the driver or in the uh, constructor standings. Oh, okay. And my biggest surprise is Checo makes it to the end of the race. <laughs> That's funny because my oops is Checo. And I said <laughs> Checo's just gonna bomb his home race again. So I, I think Checo's gonna have a hard weekend and yes. he won't get any points and that will help Ferrari jump. Um, yeah. And I mean, not to like throw anything out to the rumor mill because this always happens every year anyway, but maybe like last year when the rumors were swirling, he will actually announce his retirement this weekend. <laughs> I don't think it'll happen. Catherine, but. here's the thing. That guy will go kicking and screaming and will be holding onto his steering wheel, crying and yelling and pleading with Christian Horner before he <laughs> retires. We You're all know not. this. No, yeah. I'm not. Yeah. And I then- will sit and wear full Red Bull gear head to toe if he retire if he announces his retirement this weekend. All right. Handshake. Huzzah. All right, okay. and my dumb is now that Alpine is no longer pretending to be a McLaren, they're going to go back into the, you know, the doldrums of the, the grid where they belong. Love it. All right, final thoughts. Super excited to see the race. Super excited to see what happens. I also want to see Liam Lawson, honestly, with just like a normal race weekend, see what he can do. Um, see if he, he tangles has- with Fernando again. Right, he did not race in um, Mexico City last year, so this will be his first F1 race in Mexico City. Check! Um, so it'll be interesting to see him, but I'm excited. Love Mexico City. Yeah, this is gonna be this is this is always a fun weekend. You know, we we talked about um, you know last week. Cota is really conducive of an exciting you know race weekend in general. So is Mexico City. Every, everything about it is exciting. Obviously, we have a really exciting constructors battle and an exciting drivers championship battle, which is really moving more and more in, in Max's favor right now. But it's it's still there's a lot of excitement happening up and down the grid as we come into like the home stretch of the 2024 season, and then soon the 2024 season will be over and we can actually talk about what we want to talk about which is 2025 (laughs) but let's be real we'll just talk about 2026 2026. (laughs) yeah Uh, all right so that brings us to the end of the podcast so Catherine what is your f1 fun fact for us before we go okay so f1 fun fact is a little bit of a surprise and I have not told you about this offline yet but I have talked about this before, but specifically um, in our episode, um, episode four of the Team Genealogy series, I talked about one of my favorite Toto Wolf moments from 2021, where he got really upset at the race director, Michael Massey's decision. No, um, Michael. Yeah, no, 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 Michael, no, this is so not right. So as we know, one of the big fans of the podcast is my father, and when I mentioned that, he happened to go on Amazon and he found me something. No! He found me 
a Total oh Wolf coffee God. mug <laughs> with the quotes. <laughs> moment with the headband yep. oh it's so good oh my gosh I'm so jealous your dad is such a great dad well here's the thing I have one for you too <gasps> ah! oh my gosh now we can like cheers yes that's so exciting so I will get that to you eventually one day <laughs> But yes. Oh my gosh, this is such a fun, fun fact. Yes. So not only that, but this was supposed to arrive on my dad's birthday as a gift for from him for me on the day of his birth. So <laughs> thanks, thanks, Paul, friend of the show, and dad thanks. for our coffee mugs. Oh, and thanks, now I dad. don't have to go all the way to the F1 exhibition, which I think is in like Amsterdam right now, because that is where we first saw those cups in the gift shop. And I was like, I need that in my life. Not the same cup, but still cool as hell. It's, and I love it. And it's cool. It's the best. Yes. Oh, I so. can't wait to have my morning coffee with Toto Wolf. <laughs> yep, there we go. <laughs> oh, well, what a great way to end the podcast on such a high. Mm-hmm. Love this. Oh, well, that is our episode. Or oh, la, 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 <laughs> words. <laughs> it's been a long week. And it's only Wednesday. Oh, that God. has been our prediction episode for Mexico City Grand Prix. Thanks for going out track with us, guys.